Very nice to meet you. Very nice to have you here at Show Studio, Dr. Frank Sintanami. Um, you are the president of the Asian Couture Federation. Um, could you just tell me to start this interview a little bit about your personal history, about where you come from, about your family? Well, I, I don't actually have anything to do with the fashion industry. Uh, my, my, my schooling and training has been so far from this industry, it's, it's almost strange that I find myself uh, in, in fashion now. So uh, I have a legal uh, background. My, my family were uh, very much in commerce and industries related to the oil industry. So right. we're so far from fashion, it's, it's, it's so, quite hilarious that we're here. So what happened? At what point did um, fashion suddenly become I guess the transformation happened about uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. So I, I was invited to chair uh, a fashion initiative uh, in Asia, and I, I guess I caught the bug, as it were. Right. Uh, and and it's, it's, I've not looked back, and, and everything I do now is very much entrenched in fashion. I'm interested in, in what exactly happened to make you get involved in fashion. Was there a particular, is it, was it, is it, have you always harbored the desire to be involved? Is it something? No, no. I, I think I'm the least fashionable person I know. Um, I, I saw, I, I, what, what I felt was I saw a need that uh, was desperately not addressed as, as far as Asian fashion goes. Right. Um, I, I thought that um, the huge exodus of uh, incredible Asian talent to the West was yeah. uh, remissive of a lot of Asian countries not, not having done more uh, to provide platforms that would entice such designs to stay on in yeah. the domicile countries. So I, I, that was the, my initial um, instigation, if you like, uh, into fashion. So I was Have you seen that change? Because I get the feeling from mm -hmm. working with uh, a few Asian countries, um, I opened an exhibition in Korea last year, and I was told very much that, you know, that, that there seems to be a change. Are you feeling that too? It, it, has, it has started to take, to take place, but not uh, fast enough. And I think um, the industry needs to provide more for these designers to want to stay in, in, in some of these cities. Right, so in, in what way? So government support or...? Oh yeah, Gov government support, private sector support. Uh, yeah. uh, just the infrastructure alone, I think, needs to be shored up. Um, if, if you look at cities like London, New York, Paris, yeah. Milan, uh, there's just so much that the designers can benefit from being in those cities. And, and I can't find uh, a comparable uh, city yet, but they, they, they are definitely very um, active uh, initiatives running at the moment, and, and one is hopeful that yeah. it will get stronger and, and, and better. Yeah. Um, I talk often, and I think quite um, misguidedly, about Asian fashion mm. as if it's one thing. Mm -hmm. But you and I know after mm. our conversations that actually it's at least 14 different cultures, mm -hmm. um, and all very, very different from each other. So we do it a disservice by referring to it as Asian fashion. Yes. Um, but sadly, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sort of shorthand, but we'll, I'll try and avoid it. But um, whereabouts do you think in Asia? Can you give me a little bit of a sort of an idea? Who's leading the pack? Who's being most interesting? Give me some sort of plan. If you wanted to say something, oh, you mustn't miss Shanghai Fashion Week, you mustn't right. miss Seoul, where, where would you say the most interesting fashion is coming from? Well, I think it's, it's a matter of personal preference uh, yeah. as far as fashion goes. And you're quite right, Asia is not uh, a collective. It is so diverse in its offering, uh, yeah. the fashion industry. It's very, very, very difficult to find uh, what Asian fashion means. That said, I think some of the cities have done tremendous, a tremendous job of pos positioning themselves in, in, um, uh, in, in certain sectors where fashion needs to be at the moment. Uh, take Seoul, for example. Yeah. Uh, Seoul, I think, is at the cutting edge of, of, of fashion. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's become the incubator of Asian fashion. Right. It's exciting, it's fashion forward, it's uh, very futuristic in, it, in its mindset. And I'm just so excited to see what these, these designs from South Korea have been doing. And yeah. I think that, that it's brilliant that they've made themselves become that sort of a hub in such a short time. Yeah. Uh, and you move to, to, to a country like Japan and in Tokyo, and of course Tokyo is, is, is one of the most prominent countries for fashion in Asia yeah. at least. Yeah. And they've, they've traditionally produced some of the best designers Asia has, ha has, has sent across yeah. to the West. Yeah. Um, Kenzo and Yojima yeah, um, Toyo yeah, Miyaki, yeah. Ray Kakuba from Comme yeah. des They're all names that we know in the West. Yeah. But, uh, but I wonder if the Japanese are still producing these designers. And I yeah. wonder if uh, they are as progressive as the Koreans are. 
Right. Uh, and you move to, to, to a city like Shanghai and Beijing where yeah. the energy is wonderful, it's new, the market is, is beautifully opened up um, and they've um, evolved the position very, very quickly, uh, much, much quicker than any other city that I've seen in, in Asia. Right. And that is tremendous. In fact, even the uh, personal preferences and, and evolution uh, of, of understanding what fashion truly is um, has happened very, very quickly for, for China. And that's yeah. most impressive. Incredibly impressive. It's, it's only a, a short time that it's really sort of been in the, yeah. in the fashion world in the way that we understand fashion. Can you give me a little bit of idea of, if you think that Seoul and, and South Korea are producing interesting fashion, weird, because China's a, a massive, massive continent mm. and can't be, again, regarded as yeah. one thing. So where in China are things happening and how is that different from what's happening in Seoul? Well, I, I think the, uh, the two cities to note are uh, definitely Beijing and Shanghai as yeah. far as fashion weeks and, and initiatives to do with fashion goes. And I've had the opportunity to, to see what, what Shanghai is doing, what Beijing is doing, and, and it's uh, not entirely the same, but very much supportive of the industry. And right. again, you know, once China sets its mind to doing something, it does it on, on a very grand and very uh, extensive way. And, and that's, that's very impressive for me. One must remind uh, ourselves that uh, this is a very, very new initiative for them. Yeah. And they are still trying to understand, to figure out what works and what doesn't work for the, for the market. Uh, yeah. But, but in, at, at this stage, I think they're progressing beautifully. What uh, do you think doesn't work? Well, I think the, the sheer numbers of designers that are participating in some of the initiative, yeah. uh, in, in my personal opinion, ten, tend to dilute the focus. Uh, it's, it's difficult for the media and buyers to gravitate towards the brands that, that needs the, the, the support. Because fashion isn't about supporting a person that claims to be designer. I think, yeah. I think you need to be very discerning about uh, where you position that support. Yeah. It can only go so far. And, and if, if that's uh, uh, provided uh, too vastly across the board, I think it's, it's difficult to... to, to uh, to then discover true talent and true stars in fashion. A lot of Western companies, a lot of Western brands, have obviously because of the, the vastness of the Asian market, have been very interested in, in getting involved. Um, what would you say as a most frequent um, faux pas, the most frequent um, uh, bad ways of doing that? What, do you, what, do, what mistakes have you seen from Western brands going into Asia. Well, first of all, so as, as we mentioned earlier on, yeah. to, to assume that Asia is uh, a collective, homogeneous breed of people, then that's clearly not the case. Yeah. And I think you need to have uh, a strategy that is so unique uh, for each different city. In entering a market like China, for example, each province may, may have different customs and different likes and dislikes. I think that's the first huge mistake, huge cardinal mistake, that there is only one Asian plan rather than right. multiple yeah. plans for, for the very various Asian markets that they're trying to penetrate. Right. Uh, we wouldn't do that trying to come to the West. We wouldn't have a European plan or a Western yeah. plan. Yeah. America is America, London is London, Paris is Paris. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you, you should have a, a unique bespoke plan for each country. Yeah. Um, which companies do you think have done it well? Brands that are not in fashion, I think, has done it a lot better than fashion brands. Oh, really? Uh, oh, right. yeah, absolutely. Um, Apple, for example, I, th I think has yeah. done a wonderful job of showing how that can actually happen in various markets. Some of my favorite brands in Asia happens to not be uh, in, from, from the fashion industry. Chinese culture, Japanese culture is very much a print-based culture historically. Mm -hmm. um, but how has the internet changed? Has the internet now become the main way of seeing fashion in Asia? Or is it... Uh, still in magazines? No, no. I think the internet has definitely been the main uh, source for consumption of fashion. Yeah. Um, magazines do still act as a very good arbiter of, of what uh, should be consumed, not consumed, and so on. But I, if the question is uh, how most people consume fashion, it's definitely on online, right. both, both in terms of getting your news and, and purchasing your products. Uh, for example, in China, uh, yeah. The company Alibaba, th that's not an option for people. It's not as if uh, people view shopping online as, as an extension uh, to shopping offline. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's full integrated uh, as part of their way of life. Um, I, I feel that shopping online is, is an option. If, if I don't feel like going to stores, if yeah. I think that the yeah. uh, variety is available more prevalently online, I'll go online. But I, I think in China, it's, it's a way of life. It's, it's fully integrated to their... Uh, daily routine. Right. Um, we've, you know, certainly in the West, we're, in a way, we've got such an entrenched history of the system of making fashion. So we have the fashion show, the presentation, mm. and, and then the advertising that comes 
past that. But then now there are new ways of showing fashion. I launched a fashion film this weekend yeah. for Gareth Pugh rather than doing a collection. Yeah. Um, do you think that sort of thing, because Asia is a little bit more new into this, it doesn't quite have the history, do you think they'll, they'll take different approaches to showing collections or do you think they're going to in some way imitate what the West has done for years and actually I think it's now changing? I think we've always been imitating the West, especially right. when it comes to pop culture and, and definitely in fashion as well. Um, but the new platforms and formats of uh, presenting fashion has, uh, has happened in Asia, uh, not as much as, as the traditional runways, uh, but, but, but you do see installations and, and fashion films and uh, more innovative ways of presenting fashion. Yeah. Could you describe to me what the Asian Couture Federation actually does, so I understand? Right. So we've been mandated to yeah. promote, support, and um, protect designers that are of Couture standard. Right. Um, but they have to be initially based in, in their domicile country in Asia. Right. Uh, the reason for this is that a lot of um, the government agencies that I'm working with are, are concerned that um, the next generation of designers may not want to, to, to delve into the couture industry. Right. And that's a great shame because the, the artistry and the craftsmanship and, and yeah. the talent and knowledge may die off with the current generation of couture designers. Yeah. So in, in, in doing so, we, were, uh, we found ourselves creating a commercial platform for these designers so that they can find um, a continued existence yeah. in the market. So at the moment you're, you're, you're starting to show um, Asian designers as part of the Couture Weeks in Paris. Mm -hmm. Do you see there being a sort of Asian Couture Week which becomes more important than the French ones? Because th th we've got, what, 15 or so different mm -hmm. Couturiers that show in Paris now. Mm -hmm. And it's all, every season it, there's a sort of feeling, this might be the last time. You know, if, you, if you're really putting Couturiers into a new system like that, do you think that, that at some point the Asian couture and the Asian fashion market is actually going to be what the West wants to be involved in rather than the, the other way around? Well, I, I wouldn't want to speak for Paris, but um, people have been uh, planning funerals for, for couture designers in Paris yeah. for tens of years. Yeah. And I don't think it will have ever happen. I think couture will always have a place uh, in the world of fashion. Uh, and I think that Paris is the absolute bastion of couture. Right. Uh, there is something very unique and special about yeah. Paris and couture, and I don't think anyone can replace that, not, not even come close to competing with that position. It just has been so deeply entrenched in the culture in France that um, it's, it's Im unimaginable for me, anyway, at least in my lifetime, that any city can replicate that. But the trades that go around couture, the sort of embroidery and the feathers mm -hmm. and the lessages and everybody, you know, do you, are, those is there, are those trades that you want to take back to, to Asia or are there already, there must be amazing? Uh, well, to be, to be clear on, on the position, we're not trying to replicate what France has done so wonderfully. Right. Uh, we're, we're trying to support the industries that we currently already have in Asia. Right. Uh, we, we have the lesages, we have our embroideries, we have our beaches, we have, a... we have vast uh, network and, and, and resources that are scattered right across Asia. Hmm. So, so, so the task here is to support that across the board, making sure that the, the individual couture houses that are domiciled, for example, in, in Korea, that they're aware that someone in India or in Thailand has a specific skill set, a specific, a specific talent that, that they can apply and adopt in their own trade and, and, and business. So we're, we're, we're integrating the network to make people understand that there are these services available within Asia yeah. uh, and, and not necessarily have to look towards France for the trade because aside from everything else, it's hugely expensive in, 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 yeah. in Paris, yeah. so, which, which makes it not very practical for, for Asian designers to have uh, as part of the uh, offering. Yeah. A question I want to ask you that actually our editor, Lou Stoppard, asked me to ask you. Let me just read it to you. The Met's China Through Looking Glass exhibition, mm. um, it also got known as how Western designers interpret Asian styles. Do you think Asian style and techniques are too often appropriated rather than celebrated and acknowledged in their own right? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's entirely true, not, not only uh, within the fashion industry, but also um, in, in, in popular culture, in movies and films. Yeah. Uh, I think the most recent criticism that came up very strongly was, so the movie Ghost in the Shell, yeah. um, and, and that they used a Caucasian actress rather than an Asian actress yeah. was appalling to many Asian people, yeah. and, and, and were they not able to find someone out of the 
two, three billion Asians <laughs> that, to, 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 to fill that role. So I think yeah. this has been happening for, for generations, and, and I think it's not uh, specifically unique uh, to the fashion industry. Uh, but to derive inspiration from, from different cultures, I think is, is absolutely fine. Um, uh, I don't think um, uh, many designers I speak to feel too aggrieved if, the, if they would see if they saw a Western designer create uh, an Asian influence um, mm. a collection. After all, uh, Asia is very, very uh, influenced by the West uh, yeah. constantly, wow. even much more so than, than the West is of Asia. Um, just moving on a little bit, I want to ask you a little bit about the difficulties of trying to work in China because mm. of the censorship. Mm. Um, I'm, not, I'm sure China isn't the only uh, country in, in, in Asia that has um, censorship issues. Um, do you find that something that, that, that's very hindering, or is it something that you just have to work your way around? Mm. Quite honestly, I've, I've not felt um, any hindrance whatsoever. Right. Um, uh, th there has not been an occasion where I felt the work that we did in China was in any way, shape, or form political. Right. Uh, and we work with a lot of different government agencies in China, and we've never been cautioned or told what to say and what not to say, or what to do, what not yeah. to do. So we've been, uh, we've been fortunate, I guess, but I yeah. personally have not um, felt um, any of that in yeah. any of the work that we've done. Good. I mean, I, I wonder if it's something that fashion is outside of most people's area of knowledge, mm -hmm. so they don't feel that they're able to criticise it. Mm -hmm. and in some way, it's a little bit left to be its own thing. Yeah. Well, we're told not to have imageries of, of religious imageries, like having huge crosses on someone's right, right. chest and, and things like that, or, and for it not to be uh, uh, politically inclined. And, and, yeah. and our fashion designers tend not to be, and, and it has not hindered their ability to design or uh, be creative. This, this was not factored into um, any of the creative processes in, in creating collection. Right. So it hasn't presented itself as a problem, and, and I don't uh, foresee this being a problem for myself at least. There's been a, a very sad few cases of designers who have faced, who have faced so much pressure mm -hmm. um, through the fashion industry that, for instance, Alexander McQueen took his own life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, John Galliano got seriously and also um, had a very, very hard time of it. And that's, that's, you know, that's been, there's been a few high profile cases mm. of that. And that's the pressure of the fashion industry. Mm. Do you think Asian designers are looking at that and therefore avoiding it? Is there something you think that can be done to, to stop that pressure? Well, I, I don't think the average Asian designer faces quite the same pressure as someone like McQueen did, or, or definitely Giuliano did, or Ralph Simmons recently did with yeah, yeah. Um, the, the larger houses in Paris and, and, and the West uh, just demands that much more from, from the designer. Yeah. I mean, we've seen this, this revolving door movement of designers yeah. from one brand to another brand, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the constant need to be creative, and, and I, I personally don't understand how someone can churn out uh, uh, multiple designs in, 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 in one yeah. single year. Uh, but again, in, in, in France, uh, in, in, in Asia, uh, especially the designers that we have dealt with, uh, that, that certainly is not the, the case. Most of my designers produce all but two collections a year. And, a lot more and, human. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and best uh, one, one trunk collection in between that. So yeah. we, don't, we don't do 10, 12 collections a year. So that, yeah. that has not happened in, in Asia, thankfully. But I guess it, it, it's, it's very much the uh, price you pay for uh, success. Uh, yeah. the, the commercial demands uh, requires that these designers do as much as they do. But it's unfortunate and, and that system must change. Creativity cannot be manufactured. Um, and, and, and I think that's an absolutely insane way of, uh, of producing fashion. Because well, well, I'm correct to think that you come from this from a, a business perspective. Um, and as a businessman, do you feel that how can you get around the fact that at the, the centre of a great fashion company, you essentially have an artist? Mm -hmm. All the erratic and all the sort of unpredictable behaviour an artist has, but that is the, the, the motor that drives his companies. What would you sort of recommend to a company? Or what, what, how do you feel that that can be best worked with? Well, what we do is we tend to isolate the designers and allow, allow the designers to do what they do best, and that is to yeah. create. Uh, we do not try to incumbent the designers with having to actually run the business of, of, of the yeah. fashion houses. We, we mitigate that, that process for them so that they can just purely and fully concentrate on the business of creating fashion, whereas we look after the rest of the uh, requirements of the fashion designer. Uh, that has worked quite well for us. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and not to put any more demands on top of the 
uh, designers already very challenging requirements, I think has worked very well for us. Yeah. Um, and, and, and certainly not to put demands beyond reason. I, th yeah. I think creating multiple collections just to satisfy uh, uh, the need for novelty and variety in the market is, is, is not uh, sustainable. Um, and I very much feel that, that the entire structure will go back in to, to the whole, in, uh, whole couture way people are, are operate, have, have, have used, uh, used to yeah. operate business. Yeah. Uh, and, and by that I mean um, uh, moving away so much from, from worrying about uh, throwing out design after design on, on a weekly basis and moving back to the core uh, business of creating fashion. Uh, and I think couture will be the new way fashion will be uh, consumed. Yeah, I think you're right. I, it certainly feels that there's, a, there's a, a movement towards, this comes from the designers, a movement towards small rather than big. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I know, you know that Alexander McQueen was thinking about going smaller. Mm -hmm. And in a way, success needn't be about the hugest of things. Success can be that you have 20 great clients mm -hmm. and you produce incredible fashion for those mm -hmm. great clients. So it does feel like there's a sort of move towards that. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel that the, the system we have at the moment is sustainable yeah. at all. Um, but there is such a, a, a huge amount of people in, in China and in Asia. Mm. Is that possible to see fashion at small? You know, it seems to be that you, you need, simply by the sheer number of, of people who will want it, yeah. how can you keep things small? So that's, that's a brilliant question. Um, we are insisting that our designers remain small, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and and we've, we've given them the opportunity to go big. Uh, we're providing them a platform that we've recently created and it's called Couturissimo. It's, it's a brand that yeah. we've, we've convened as an extension to our designers and federation. It's the ready-to-wear couture-infused version of their uh, couture works. So yeah. we, we've created a platform. We, we, we manage the whole entire position for them. Uh, we do everything from marketing to, to production, manufacturing, uh, positioning the shows, absolutely everything to do with, with what you require uh, for a fashion business. Yeah. So all we require for them on, 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 on a seasonal basis is that they create the design collection and we run, we run with that. And, and, and that gives them the ability to still maintain their couture businesses, yeah. uh, focused on that, uh, whilst we provide them with the ready-to-wear aspect of the business, which I think is important, but I think it's also uh, irresponsible uh, for, for anyone to, to, to point to a couture designer and go, yeah. you need a ready-to-wear business without, anything, with, without any other support. Uh, I think that, that is a um, uh, very dangerous advice to make. And, yeah. and, and um, designers, you, you may recall uh, what happened with Christine Lacroix. Yeah, she yeah, was absolutely. brilliant, is a brilliant yeah, designer. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the, the failings there was when he attempted to go into ready-to-wear. Yeah. And without the proper support uh, financially, without the proper infrastructure, uh, one has to understand when you go into ready to wear, you're up with incredible competition. Yeah. Uh, and without a significant war chest to fight that battle, um, it, it's almost a suicide mission. Right. So uh, we, we've made it uh, our job to provide them with those the, the logistical uh, uh, requirements. Yeah. And, and we're hoping that, that that works out for us and, and, and for them. In your opinion, what distinguishes Asian fashion from fashion you see on the catwalks of Europe and America? What, what, if you had to describe what would make it different? For me, specific cities in Asia would present fashion, taking inspiration very much from the countries that they're from. I, I tend to, to find a lot of, of ethnicity in, in, in the influences that right. are presented in Asia. Yeah. Um, so if, if I were to go to Thailand, for example, uh, yeah. I, I tend to be able to pick up the fact that this, this is a Thai designer. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a necessarily good thing or if it's a bad thing, but it's quite unique to the market. If you go to yeah. Vietnam, you can tell that these designs are Vietnamese, right. uh, or in Japan versus uh, In uh, what sort of ways, in, in the style? It, it, in the, in the, the subtleties of it, the cuts, the styling, the inescapable need to present something that is so important to their culture yeah. does tend to flow, flow, flow through yeah. the uh, uh, collections, but uh, again, I, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. Um, it, it, it's good to maintain some of those things, um, but, but that, that I think is one of the most distinguishable differences I see yeah. uh, versus attending a show in, 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 in New York or London where I, I can barely tell where what the nationality of the designer yeah. uh, is. Yeah. And to put you a little bit on the spot, mm -hmm. 
Can you name a few of the designers we should really be looking out for? Who, which are the names that we should really be watching now from Asia? Uh, that is putting me in the spot. <laughs> um, in Japan, I, I, I like a brand called Sumarta very much. Sumarta. Okay. Um, she was one of the top graduates from Bunker Fashion College, yeah. and I absolutely adore her work. Yeah. Uh, I think she is she's 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 sailed under the radar for, for for so many years, and I think once people get to hear about her a little more and see her collection, this woman is absolutely brilliant. She's she's taken in inspirations from some of the best of Japanese designers. Yeah. Um, so for me, she, she's she's quite special. Right, and I guess for for me, the most well-known designer is Gabe partly because of the Rihanna moment, which sadly, yeah. you know, or realistically, that's what, what, what makes people well known. Mm. Is she somebody who you think is, is going to be a household name soon? You think she's on the ascendant over here? Well, well indeed, she, she already is a household name in, in many households in Asia. She has a status enjoyed by no other designer in China, I think. Right. Her work is, for me, unimaginable. Uh, she, she's creative beyond uh, what I can describe. Uh, and I think the only challenge that she will have right now is to find a path into the mass market. And I, right. I, I don't know if she wants that. I, I don't think she wants yeah. that. Uh, but if, if, if the question is um, success commercially, I think she, she, she already has that. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I, I don't know if um, it, it's so important for her to be a household name, for example, in America or in Paris. Right. Uh, because she already is in, in, in many parts in Asia. Yeah, yeah. Something I'd like to understand, actually. So on Friday night, I had the pleasure of being at Kensington Palace Review for Couturissimo. At that event, um, the Asian Couture Federation uh, inducted Susie Turner yes. into it. But how does that work? Because she's not an Asian designer. She's based in, in England. Mm -hmm. So how, how, can you explain to me how that works? So we, we have various uh, categories of, of membership. So yeah. We have our core group of designers that are our permanent members. So, so they, they, they form uh, the permanent body of, of our federation which means they, they, the members um, for life. Yeah. There is a, another category, which we call invited members, and, right. and this is on a renewed basis. So right. these are perhaps more junior couture designers that we uh, extend our, 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 our platform to, but not, may not necessarily be present for the long term. So we, we, we need yeah. to see how these, the, the, the younger businesses evolve. Right. And, and if they were to evolve successfully, we offer them uh, a, a promotion, if you like, into in, in permanent membership. Right. Uh, moving across that, we have um, an international correspondent list where yeah. we would invite uh, international designers. So Susie Turner comes off the back of a, a lot of other international designers that are not Asian-based. Yeah. For example, uh, Renato Balestra, right, right. who is uh, hugely, hugely uh, important in, in, in Rome and Italy. Um, and and he's, he's a member on the list. Uh, we have members from, from Poland and Portugal and France and, and, and now England. So it's, right. I, I think to um, isolate this sort of an association based on the boundaries that you are uh, defined by is, is very limiting for us. Yeah. I think there's a lot of advantages in, in reaching out to other countries and other uh, continents across the world. And, and likewise, I think the, the members that, that have joined our federation found, uh, found the same advantages and benefits. Right. Um, and just tell me, casting your mind sort of 20 years ahead, mm -hmm. what, what do you want to achieve with the Asian Couture Federation? What's your, what are your goals? That, that current generation of uh, designers view the couture industry as a viable industry to want to work towards and be a part of. Right. Uh, I, I think the greatest fear for me is that um, it, it becomes too much of an art form and too impractical uh, to maintain in this day and age where, where fast yeah. fashion so dominates the industry yeah. um, that I would be very much pleased if um, a designer I spoke to in, in Bunker Fashion College or Central St. Yeah. Martins would say to me, Frank, I want to be a couture designer. That's right. what I want to be. I want to have a small atelier yeah. and, and in a particular city and that's what I want to have as, as, as my business. And that would be wonderful for me to hear because I don't hear that very often. Right. Excellent. Well, I hope you heard a lot more. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank for you, Nick. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you.